All right, we'll start in. Actually, the filming today is on the events of the career of Dr. Edward Holyoke, uh, initially as a student here at the University of Nebraska College of Medicine, and also in a rather long and illustrious career as a member of the Department of Anatomy here at the College of Medicine. Actually, the event today is a part of the centennial, as you know, Dr. Holyoke, for the College of Medicine, which is in 1980, 100 years. And could I start off by asking you when you came on campus here as a medical student? As a medical student, I came on campus in September of 1928. 1928. Okay. What were things like at that time? Uh, things at that time were... Uh, Oh, much as they were uh, clear up through uh, World War uh, through World War II, uh, the impression you got of the campus coming up to it was the quadrangle with the uh, south building over here and the north building over here and the hospital sitting in the middle with the uh, steps and the columns and all that. And that was just about that was just about the major format of the campus for uh, years and years and years, and that's uh, that's what it was when I came to school, of course. Who were your teachers then, I say, in um, basic sciences? We started off in um, embryology. That was the first hour, the first morning of the first day, uh, with Dr. Latta introducing you to your medical education. And he used to introduce you in a very, very effective sort of way. He, uh, the student body with the brand new freshman class was invariably all assembled because he didn't come in until the last moment. Then he came in through the back door with that quiet way of his and started down the steps. And it got, it was silent when he came in and the silence deepened and the silence deepened and the silence deepened until it was totally profound. By the time he got down in front of the lecture table and then he turned around, gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce you to your work in medicine. Embryology is an very excellent elimination course. It has many intricacies. And started off. And he started off with a historical review of the subject. We used to devote a good deal more time and effort to that kind of thing, to the background of what we were doing than we seem to have time for now. The basic sciences then, in your first year of So uh, that was the beginning. That was the beginning of the course in embryology. Hmm. And then you started that same afternoon with bacteriology. I had a man by the name of Myers here teaching it then. He left not too many years afterwards. How many were in your class at that time? Oh, uh, at that point, uh, when the class started, it must have been all 98, 98, something of that kind. That was about what was coming in. That's in round numbers. And you had a four year curriculum? We had a four year curriculum. Of course, full summer vacations, it was just like any other academic curriculum. You began late September, you were, were done about the 1st of June, and you had the summer off. Mm -hmm. And were they usually the first two years basic science? No. First two years were almost exclusively basic science. Right. And the clinical, the sophomore year, uh, they in, began introducing clinical subjects through a series of introductory courses. There was an introductory course in physical diagnosis, there was an introduction to uh, internal medicine, there was an introduction to obstetrics, uh, there was an uh, Well, those are the ones I remember very clearly. Uh, there were one or two or three more. Okay. All very, very small. You all, the uh, first two years were almost exclusively devoted to basic science. Uh, so much so that um, it was rather easy for a student in those days to take two years here and then transfer to another school for his last two years. Mm -hmm. So you were on campus then as a student from 1928? I was on campus as a medical student from 1928 until I graduated in 1934. Well, that's six years, so I obviously wasn't going right straight through medical school. Uh, 1930, I went into the Department of Anatomy as a graduate student, did a year there. And then in the um, summer of 1932, when I was about to start my senior year, which would have graduated me in 33, uh, they offered me the job in the department uh, helping to teach gross anatomy. Well, that necessitated being away from classes long enough so that I had to split my senior year and take it in two years. Mm -hmm. So that accounts for the other two years delay. I finally graduated as a medical student in 1934. 
Then I got into graduate work again while I was instructor in anatomy. You could do that in those days, be a full-grown instructor and a regular faculty member, and registered in the graduate college too. And uh, completed the PhD in 1938. Then been, uh, I was made assistant professor, practically handed me that with a degree, and I'm gone from there. So you finished medical school and took a graduate work right in the middle of the Depression. Then... Oh, yes. In fact, that had something to do with my doing it. Here were all the people coming out of medical school, going into internships with literally no way of uh, getting their bread and butter, and going on into practice and really um, meeting a clientele that paid them off at ham and eggs or bacon or what have you, mm -hmm. uh, because they didn't have any. It was a very, very good time not to get out and start practicing medicine, which of course most of our contemporaries did. And during the 30s, what happened on the College of Medicine? You said it stayed the same until... The College of Medicine uh, stayed uh, all essentially, a lot of, essentially the same. A lot of things happened. Uh, conspicuous building, no. There was some building done mostly under the auspices of the uh, federal programs, the uh, Federal Works uh, Administration and so on. Uh, it was under that program that they put the steam tunnels in and renewed them. And they uh, eventually they put an addition on the west end of Conkling Hall. And uh, eventually, toward the end of that period, just before World War II started, they got the west addition put onto the south building. Let me go back a little bit now. But there were other things. Uh, well, all right. all right. Who was dean here when you first started? In when I came as medical school, uh, Keegan was the dean. Dr. Keegan. Dr. Keegan was the dean. He had been since 1925. Okay. Uh, that following summer, he resigned to go full-time into his neurosurgical practice, and uh, Pointer went in as acting dean for a year and was made permanent dean a year later. Now, Pointer, Dr. Pointer, had been from anatomy also? Pointer uh, was professor of anatomy. He'd come up from Lincoln when the school moved up here as professor of anatomy, and he held that position clear up until he was made dean. He was acting dean for a few months during World War I, when Cutter was away. Mm -hmm. So when he came on as dean, Dr. Pointer, he then stayed as dean for, for how long? He stayed as dean for 17 years. He finally, uh, uh, he finally resigned in 1946. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And he resigned in 46. Then who came on as dean at that time? Then they brought in Lewis, who was fresh out of the army. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm and who stayed on as dean until uh, 1952. At that point, uh, Perry Tolman came back as dean. Mm -hmm. And you go from there up to the uh, time that Whitson came in. All right, all right, all right, okay. But there were a lot of other things, I think, that uh, bear mentioning in the 30s. In the first place, um, it was kind of, uh, nothing moved very fast, but nothing moved very fast anywhere. Our budget had been cut by the legislature, and it was more or less a matter of hang on. The curriculum stayed very much the same through all those years, with minor modifications. That was the period when the old guard was rapidly disappearing. There were a few of them left, or a number of them left, in 1928 and 29 when I came to school. And by uh, 1938, they were practically all of them gone. And I'm talking about uh, Jonas and surgery, and uh, E.L. Bridges, and W.O. Bridges and uh, J.E. Summers, and McClanahan in pediatrics, and uh, Patton in ophthalmology, and uh, Gifford disappeared from the scene right along there. And you can go on and on and on. The whole old guard that was uh, the backbone of medicine in Omaha were with, uh, were with us, uh, hanging on pretty much in 1928, and by 1934 or 35, they were practically all gone. So you saw a much transition occur then. As you so in that respect, there was a tremendous transition. The generation that grew up then and uh, got into the saddle, uh, oh, included men uh, like uh, McLaughlin, he'd come back. McGugan turned up at that time. Tolan got back from his um, internship at Peter Med Brigham. Uh, Dewey Bisgard uh, came over the hill right along in those years. McQuitty, Internal was medicine. beginning to grow up in internal medicine. 
So that whole generation was just uh, just coming into the picture. Then there were some intermediates that kind of all uh, bridged the gap, like Bliss and Internal Medicine and Conlon and so on. Now these were all voluntary faculty basically. All voluntary. All the clinical teaching was done by a volunteer staff. We had a little help um, in clinical pathology from a man or men that were paid part-time. We had Macklin here who uh, helped with the anesthesiology and did some work in radiology. Then we had a full-time man come into uh, radiology by the name of Peters. He came from Michigan and I think probably turned up in 27 or along in there. I know he resigned in 29 and they brought in Howard Hunt. And of course you know the rest of that story, the years and years and years that Howard Hunt ran radiology. But that was it. Actually, there was another change you lived through, I guess, more recently. That was the full-time staff in clinical sciences. In the clinical. Oh, Africa. yes. Oh, yes. That entire thing, that entire thing developed within my time. That was in the Most middle. of it after World War II. Yes. In the 50s. Uh, in the 50s. The first step in that direction uh, came out of the maternal child health program in, I think, 41. And they brought in a man uh, in pediatrics and a man in obstetrics, namely John Getgood, who we remember very well, and Willis Brown, who was here for two or three years and moved on to the University of Iowa. Hmm. These were full-time or part-time? They were full-time. I see. I see. Neither of them was in charge of the department. Mm -hmm. But it was in the middle 50s then we began to have the full-time um, individuals. Yes, there were uh, things began moving in that direction, uh, rather before that. It must have been about 50 or 51, they brought in a full-time chairman for obstetrics and gynecology. And uh, he lasted one year and left. And then uh, that was about as far as it went until they brought in the four full-time chairmen of the uh, four major clinical departments other than uh, psychiatry. And uh, the four men that they brought in, they must have come in 53 or 54. I wish I could be precise on that, but I know that is very close. Uh, were Musselman in surgery and Grissom in internal medicine and uh, Gibbs in pediatrics, and Roy Holly in obstetrics and gynecology. So that's a whole new era now. Um, now a whole new era begins to dawn very rapidly there because they began bringing in clinical staff with them, full-time clinical staff. And then, of course, the town and gown uh, uh, situation began to develop with the volunteer faculty beginning to feel sort of pushed out of the picture. Uh, to some extent, I think, because the, uh, some of the full-time clinical people didn't quite appreciate them, and to some extent they were here and the other people were not, and uh, working them in uh, got to be a little bit difficult. I don't want to take sides on that thing, but, but, but um, because I knew both groups of people so well that when the town and gown fight uh, uh, began to really get kind of warm, I used to feel rather uncomfortable about it. I had very much the feeling that here the birds and the uh, beasts were at war and I was a bat. That was about the position I was in. <laughs> all, right, all right. So that was the move toward full-time faculty mm -hmm. in the middle 50s. And then, then let's see. Um, I should have picked up dates to come over here, precise dates. But uh, within a very few years, uh, they brought in another full-time head for otorhinolaryngology. And um, that was Tom Yarrington. And uh, of course, well, we went to a full time head in uh, neurology and psychiatry, since, of course, made into two separate departments. When uh, I think it was at the time that Rich Young died, sure it was. And the pressure, as far as the faculty were con uh, concerned at that point, was to put Bob Wington in. Well, Cecil Whitson was down here at uh, MPI, and they put him in instead. So we'd gone, you see, to a full-time person there, full-time in the sense that uh, he was uh, devoted to institutional work full-time. He was really allied with, the, uh, with NPI rather more than the College of Medicine, which promptly changed. It took them until um, 
not too awfully long ago to finally bring in Ray records for ophthalmology. See, Gifford headed that department until, I guess, pretty close to 1970. Somewhere along in there, the records finally came. Mm -hmm. So you've seen that move then? So, um, and then in each case, the departments got more and more completely staffed up with their own people here and depended more and more on the full-time staff and less and less on the volunteer staff. A distinct change in the evolution. Um, so currently, the volunteer staff functions more than in any other way, looking after the students as they go off on services in the affiliated hospitals, like Clarkson and like Methodist and so on. Now, in the 70s, then, you also saw not only the increase in staff, but also physical construction, buildings. Uh, building began uh, back in the 50s when we went through that, that whole episode that finally led to a uh, apportionment of six million dollars for construction at the College of Medicine and was uh, uh, and uh, precipitated the putting up of Unit 3 of the hospital. And during the very early 1950s, the uh, new nursing school, though at that time new nursing school went up, and, of course, um, the uh, nursing school then promptly pulled out of Conkling Hall. That had been the nurse's home up until then. And the Memorial Research Laboratory down over the hill was put up during that era. The real build, uh, uh, the real big building program that really truly changed the face of the place uh, came after Dr. Whitson became dean and finally uh, negotiated the uh, construction of, uh, we called it the Basic Science Building then, uh, now Whitson Hall, with a library writing sort of piggyback on top, which of course is what we have now. And then came Unit 4 on the hospital, and uh, then of course the last step down the line was the so-called ambulatorium. That was what everybody called it at the time that it was being built. We call it the clinic building now. Okay. And during that uh, uh, during that same episode, coming up to about 1970, they put up the permanent parking structure across the street and began to move over across 42nd Street. And then it was after the 70s that uh, we really went across the street and began by putting up still another brand new college of nursing and the pharmacy college, which moved up from Lincoln. So you've seen many changes then. So all that, the entire face of the place is completely changed. Getting back to I yourself. didn't get back to the putting up of the Epley, the, the um, Epley, Institute. Epley Institute. All right. All right. <coughs> Getting back to yourself now, you finished graduate work, you then taught here at the College of Medicine. <coughs> well, I finished my graduate work in uh, 1938. Mm -hmm. So at that point, I went from instructor and graduate student. As far as anybody um, in the student body was concerned, I was an instructor all the way through that, mm -hmm. uh, to a little bit more permanent member of the staff, namely an assistant professor. Along about in there, but um, I was beginning to get notions of getting married. And uh, a year or two after that, of course, uh, World War II came over the horizon. And then, since I had a reserve commission at that point, I was promptly told to resign it, that I was an essential teacher here. So I obviously set out the war here. Well, by the end of the war, I was past the point of no return. I'm talking about going over to clinical practice. Mm -hmm. By that time, I had a family. By that time, uh, I was getting on into my late 30s. And it seems as though by that time, every time I began thinking about uh, possibly making a change, why somebody came along and uh, tacked a little bit more onto the salary, that sort of thing happened. So one way or another, you stayed I in anatomy. stayed on. I stayed in anatomy. How did things go in anatomy for you? Did you enjoy the work? Very much. That was uh, fitted me very, very well. I very much liked doing it all the way. I was spared the phase of medicine that I never did like the idea of, and that is the economic phase, the business of sending bills, the business of uh, making collections and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. I was in a position where I very rarely had to charge anybody for anything, so that, uh, the monetary end of medicine never came into the picture. I used to practice some. 
during those graduate years, for one thing, I used to fill in down at the Lutheran Hospital when a resident they had there used to go off on his two or three times a month benders over the weekend. I used to fill in there. I used to, from time to time, uh, fill in for some of my friends around town. When they went off on vacation, I ran their offices for them. Mm -hmm. I did that kind of thing. But I never actually went into my own individual private practice. You were in anatomy? Yeah. For years and years, I used to get called over and scrub in with a surgeon when he thought he was going to get into an anatomical problem that he might want a little help with. Mm -hmm. I've been doing that off and on until about... Uh, I almost dropped that when I became chairman of the department because there didn't seem to be time. When did you become chairman of the department? 1960. 1960. Mm -hmm. 1960. You're writing some of your um, recollections and anecdotes about some of your mm -hmm. colleagues, both in basic science and clinical. Uh, how do those events uh, affect your life as far as... Let me be very blunt. Uh, I first met you 25 mm -hmm. years ago, and you scared me to death. Uh, the uh, cubicle and the star chamber as far as the examination, mm -hmm. uh, was that something you were accustomed to, or was that part of the treatment? That was part of medical student life. Mm -hmm. And I mean, uh, my generation got the same treatment from a slightly different uh, group of individuals. Uh, Dr. Latta, of course, was one of the most frightening things that ever presented himself to a uh, brand new class. And uh, then there was Gradinsky up there in anatomy, and uh, his chief uh, claim to fame was the way he could tear a student apart. I think he went into teaching anatomy with the idea that uh, medicine is rather traumatic anyway. We might just as well give them the works as freshman students here and see if they can take it and how he could give them the works. So try and desensitize them in a rather traumatic way? Or? Well, whatever he did, it was traumatic. Mm. Didn't make any difference how good you were. If the slightest little flaw or something like that, he'd take off and break you up one side and down the other. Usually in that big stentorian voice he had that you could hear all over the floor of the uh, old north building. Mm -hmm. You spent a long part of your life mm -hmm. in that fourth floor. Then. I should say I did. That's right. That's right. That's right. And then Pointer was a rather imposing character to a freshman student. Hmm. He was an anatomist, and then he became dean. Then he became dean. I think uh, Pointer is remembered as a really colorful factor, as kind of a unique personality. A good deal more by the people that had him in his years as professor of anatomy than the students that were here during the time he was dean. He was still the same kind of a personality, but he was a little bit more remote. He was off there in the dean's office, and um, he didn't play quite the same role in the medical education that he used to as professor of anatomy. But the point was that uh, here you were, you came into school with a group of, say, 100 students. That was cut to 85 after a while and was stable there for years and years. Uh, you knew perfectly well that that class was going to be down to somewhere around 75 to 80 by the time it got through with the uh, sophomore year. That a good deal of what was done to it will be done in the freshman year. Uh, you were playing for high stakes. You really didn't know whether you could make it or not. And very obviously, it was a high-pressure proposition. And very obviously, a lot of particularly insecure students that were on the borderline found it very traumatic. Those of us were fortunate enough to stand up here a little higher and the class began to get a little bit more secure when we found out that we were making it. But does that have something to do with intelligence or just your overreaction to stress? I, I oh, think I think in most cases, uh, the students that didn't make it didn't make it for a combination of, uh, let's say, aptitude plus interest plus motivation. Some of them weren't quite motivated enough to really and truly uh, study effectively. And a few of them, I think, that might perfectly well have made it folded up under stress. I do think that is true with a few. It perhaps still is, but I don't know how you build a certain amount of stress out of medical education. You're playing uh, any way you look at it. You're playing for what uh, you hope is going to be your life career. Now you're facing the test, and are you going to make it or, or aren't you? There's no way of keeping that out of the picture. 
It just wasn't quite so blatantly stuck in your face all the time now as it was then. Looking back over and it's almost 50 years, what do you think have been a significant changes in medical education? You alluded to some in basic sciences earlier. Of course, medical, uh, medical education changed, uh, um, straight ahead streamlined itself in many ways. For instance, uh, they will tell you that all three-fourths or more, and I think that's a conservative figure, of all that is known of medical science has turned up since I started medical school. So there's a great deal more to learn. Well, at the same time, people were beginning to get restive with the idea that they couldn't get on the medicine, they couldn't get their hands on it uh, until two years of basic science. And the feeling was that a student would be a little bit more highly motivated if he got around got to being, quote, a doctor a little earlier in his career. Now, whether that is true or whether it is not, I don't know. I've always wondered about that. But that was the feeling. And then there was a feeling that clinical medicine had grown to the point that perhaps some stuff that wasn't totally relevant was taking up time in the teaching of basic science, trim back the teaching of basic science, streamline that, streamline that, and make it more efficient. You'll have more uh, time to teach the clinical medicine. The first target, of course, was anatomy because that had far and away the biggest block of time. So that over the years, when I started medical school, the course in gross anatomy ran 450 hours. And the Department of Anatomy collectively had something over 900. We had the entire freshman year, except afternoons, for half of a semester. And that was devoted to bacteriology. Other than that, it was all anatomy. Embryology, the gross anatomy, the histology, and then the neuroanatomy. That filled the whole year. How does that compare to now as far as the time of anatomy? All of anatomy now it was pretty, uh, pretty much taught in the uh, first two quarters. And other things are taught at the same time. They're taking their biochemistry now. I'm ashamed to say I don't know precisely what the curriculum for those students is because I'm away from the curriculum committee and it changes from time to time, but that's the general idea. Right. 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 Any changes you've seen reflected as far as the clinical aspects of medical school? Uh, oh, yes. Uh, the, old, uh, the old system of, as a junior student, you went up on the wards and were a clinical clerk. That was your hospital contact, that was your clinical teaching then, plus all the various clinics when they brought the patients in in front of you and the lectures and so on that were held. The senior year, you went into the clinics and put in your services there. You also had an out-call service, packed up your little bag and went off to the far reaches of Omaha and uh, saw people at home. That, of course, is long gone. The old philosophy of clinical instruction, I think, has changed a good deal. The, uh, uh, the just plain lecture, hour after hour after hour, sitting in lectures that we used to do has been modified. There were days um, every week during that junior year where you were literally sitting down there in that old medical amphitheater for six or seven hours a day. Hmm. What do you feel about the changes? Have they been for the better or? Probably mostly for the better. I think uh, there's been enough time pressure put on, particularly with a three-year curriculum. So we've got away to some extent from the uh, philosophy of medicine. Your medical education comes so fast you don't have any time to sit back and think about it. One thing I think that may be restored a little bit with going back to a four-year curriculum. Nobody seems to have time anymore to uh, develop the uh, history of embryology or the history and philosophy of anatomy, which used to be done for us so very, very ably by Lata uh, at the very beginning and Dr. Pointer later on. You got a kind of a feeling for the atmosphere of medicine that as far as I can see isn't given the student anymore. I do think to some extent medical education has, uh, let's say, changed from what used to be a period of education into a period of training, if you can... Uh, yes. But we were, um, everything now has to be relevant. Everything has to be applicable. Everything has to be at the root of a definite clinical problem. Otherwise, uh, you don't have time for it. 
This in spite of the fact that someday something that isn't particularly relevant, say physiology or anatomy, might suddenly turn out to be highly relevant to something that hasn't come over the hill yet in clinical medicine. I've seen that happen many, many times. Okay. okay. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate mm -hmm. your sharing the events of your own career here at the College of Medicine and how you've seen the College of Medicine evolve for almost the last 50 years. It had been over 50 years. Thank you very much, Dr. Holyoke. Thank you.